Hello, and welcome back to the Self Healer Soundboard. For those of you who have been tuning in or hear either of us talk about the process of change, you'll hear us talk about the process of first becoming conscious to how it is that we are experiencing the world around us before we can begin to create change. And pretty universally, um, as we become conscious, I think the number one thing that we hear is how uncomfortable it is to pay attention to ourselves in this new way and how overwhelming it can then be. So we thought we would dedicate an episode to diving into the topic of overwhelm on our healing journey. It makes a lot of sense, especially when you are on a journey of healing and becoming conscious, which is really just becoming aware, becoming aware of this conditioning, habits, patterns, aware of even your wounding and trauma or certain things maybe you haven't grieved or really suppressed emotions. There's so much swirled in us that we really embark on becoming aware of when we are on a healing journey. So as you start to set the intention to become conscious and then actually practice cultivating and strengthening your own consciousness, you're becoming more and more aware to all of these things that in a mode of protection, you have suppressed or ignored or denied for so long. So it makes so much sense. And I hope offers some comfort to people who do find themselves, you know, saying those words, I feel so overwhelmed, or I feel like I'm resisting this change, or I feel stuck. It's so valid and really a very normal Mm -hmm. biological response that you are feeling that way because now suddenly your eyes are wide open to what you've really chosen to subconsciously shut out and look away from for really your entire life. And the reason why we do that subconsciously, just to even speak to your beautiful point in there, which is of protection. So many of us have gotten so adapted to distracting ourselves, to you know, if you resonate with my journey, being dissociated or so disconnected from even our physical bodies where our emotions live. And we've learned how to do that, of course, in our earliest environments, within our earliest relationships, when we weren't safe to do otherwise. There was a lack of safety in that conscious awareness. There was a lack of humans who, you know, were attuned enough to us or safe enough in themselves to allow that container for us. So we adapt it And then we rely on these habitual ways because if we're being perfectly honest, it is more comfortable to keep ourselves running from those things, to keep them so below the surface or to just be so disconnected in general that, you know, a lot of you who do resonate with my journey, you know, being aloof, being appearing from the outside that nothing bothers us again is a protective mechanism from actually touching the depths of how deeply we are bothered, hurt, or in pain. Yeah. It becomes a source of comfort because it's familiar. And as much as we would say, you know, violence or trauma isn't comfortable, no one wants that. Well, if that is where you came from and what you largely knew, then yes, that is your comfort. I know for me, there are still deep parts of me that feel most comfortable, most connected and most alive even in despair, in feelings of grief, in moments of incredible trauma. There could be, you know, an explosion next to me and that will actually be when I'm most rooted, when I'm most grounded and most calm because that equates to my old familiar. So it's helpful, I think, for us to really look at where we do find that refuge and not to make that wrong. Like, We pay money to go see sad movies and to draw up sad emotions or listen to sad songs. I know in my teenage years and very deep depression, I would just lock myself away in a room and put on an album that I could just cry and dance to for hours because that was my comfort. That was really a refuge and a safe haven for me. So as we begin to become conscious, choose to become aware, choose to step back and see the all of what's happening instead of thinking that I am all of the things that are happening to me, but instead peeling back and seeing it all for what it is, which is a series of habits, of patterns, of ways of being, all that were learned and all that can be unlearned. They are not who we are They are just happenings and outward expressions of ourselves that are all really through a thought that then cues an emotion, that then cues a habit, and you can see the full cycle continuous. 
And I think one of the overwhelming aspects is when we do bear witness, see those habitual patterns, those habitual feelings. And I, of course, am giggling hearing you describe um, your familiar in the sadness and, you know, very much my familiar was overwhelm, was having endless stressful experiences with limited resources that everything did feel like it was breaking me. Um, I would often, you know, small events in the day literally would so be so destabilizing because I was so used to always feeling overwhelmed. So when I pulled back um, and viewed my familiar zone was feeling stressed all of the time, was actually looking for and sometimes even creating in my current moment something to be overwhelmed by. And when we do bear witness to ourselves in that way, we have to make space not only to see our habits, but to have our reactions, our emotions, how we feel about all of these habits, because it can be very upsetting when we see how much time We've cycled through really uncomfortable feelings, really deep rooted suffering. You know, as much as I can proclaim I want peace and love and, you know, freedom in reality, I was creating a cycle of my childhood overwhelm time and time again. So for a lot of us, it means not only witnessing, but adding to the emotional overwhelming experience of bearing witness of feeling, oh my gosh, I've created the exact thing that has been at the root of my suffering for some of us for our lifetime. It's so interesting to, I'm glad you brought up that point because so many of us say we want peace. We <laughs> want love when if we're really being honest in reality, and again, this is part of that submerged iceberg, the part that we are unaware of, or the part that is in our subconscious. If what I came from which is what I came from personally was the opposite of peace and love then my wanting actually, if I'm being real with myself, is more of the same. I might have this idealized image in my head that I want peace and love, but yet I'm resistant to it. We have to genuinely want and declare for ourselves that I want to feel good. And for a lot of us who didn't feel genuinely or authentically good or had a version of good or of love that was actually neglectful or abusive or traumatic, then that's going to feel very difficult. I know for me, even writing or my expression, my artistic expression or my creativity, my flow, genius zone, whatever you want to call it, that mode where, you know, you can just tap in or tune in and pour out your expression to the world. That for me comes in despair. It comes in moments of tragedy or moments of complete overwhelm or pushing something to the last minute so that I feel this adrenaline rush and have all of this cortisol running through my veins because that was the state I'm most comfortable in from childhood. It is very new and still often very challenging for me to sit down and and bring creation forth or to write my thoughts or to create an artistic expression or really to create anything when i'm in a state of grounded calm and peace and presence i actually find that then the most challenging to tap into myself because the self that in many ways i'm still most connected with is that self in childhood who thrived in the chaos, who thrived in the overwhelm because I learned how to navigate it as a means of survival and protection. And actually, it's bringing to mind um, very early on on our journey, Lolly would say to me when I would kind of, you know, observe a habit and pattern in someone else. And, you know, I, I would kind of, you know, from a very compassionate stance, like feel bad. Oh, they don't mean to be this way. And she would always reframe my language and saying, well, yeah, they actually do want exactly what it is that they're creating or that they're getting in their life. And, you know, really early on, that was difficult for me to agree with her in those moments that they wanted it um, because it is really difficult to say, oh, well, I might not consciously, you know, intentionally, I'm, we're stating usually the complete opposite of what we're creating, though to speak to your point, it is what has become familiar. So we want it to the extent that we want to feel safe. We want life to feel predictable. We want to be able to anticipate exactly what happens next because it's the typical thing that has always happened next. So whether or not you want to kind of take that, adopt Lolly's language in terms of acknowledging that, no, there is some part of you that wants it or reframe it 
to the extent that this is what is familiar, this is what I've come to know, that then will lead you to the possibility of, like you were saying in the beginning of this, that we can know different choices. We can know a more fullness of ourself. We can know ourselves outside of those habits and patterns, which we assumed protection in because again, they were the familiar. We got to play that tape forward and anticipate, have a sense of control and know on some level that we could navigate it, that we wouldn't be overwhelmed. Here's that word again, by something new. Yeah. Keep compassion at the ready. If you are willing to be objectively honest with yourself and say, yeah, there is a part of me that wants that. I know also with Lolly <laughs> that the very <laughs> confronting interaction of those statements for her, maybe we're talking about my family members and it's, you know, well, your mom does want X. And of course you can mm -hmm. imagine the reaction and the protective parts of me being like, what are you talking about? Stop talking smack about my mom when <laughs> really anything she said didn't, it didn't dishonor my mother at all. That is true. My mother does want a certain lifestyle. How do I know? Because it's what she has produced and continues to produce and has for really her entire life. So I could sit here and say, no, she really wants better for herself. She wants health. She wants to thrive. That's not reality. That's me with my rose colored glasses on. And mom, I love you. That does not dishonor you. I'm just looking at objective reality. And the really important thing here is not to make yourself or other people wrong for that. My mom is not lesser of a human being because she doesn't choose health and well-being or because she chooses addiction and alcoholism and everything else that she chooses. That has nothing to do with her character as a human. It doesn't dishonor her. It doesn't make her small. It doesn't make her better or worse than someone. It's just objective reality. And I say to have compassion at the ready because that's usually the first thing that goes out the window or that was never there in the first place. When you have the ability and the willingness and shout out to all of the parents and caregivers who listen to and follow our work or our videos and are willing to look, are willing to say, you know what? I didn't know better before. I didn't have that knowledge. I'm willing to look and to learn about myself and to be honest that, oh yeah, a part of me does want X or a part of me is that way. How could it not be when that's all I knew? And you can start to offer some love and compassion to that part of you, which is then going to transfer out to the rest of the world. You cannot genuinely offer love and compassion to another human being as much as we want to believe it if we cannot offer love and compassion to every single part of ourselves, because every single part of myself is just mirrored back in every other human that I engage with. You know, and I think as we become really clear um, for ourselves, you know, with other people about where things are right now, about how we, all of these habitual ways that we've learned to protect ourselves, as we become conscious, um, again, making space for all of the emotions that we might feel. And the one that's coming to mind right now for me is, is grief. So one of the biggest realizations I have had, and I still see moments in myself of how quickly and easily I, I can disconnect from my body, from the life around me. Um, and I know that I've, I have spent previously decades of my life in my self-protected spaceship, as I call it, away, away from my body, away from all of this overwhelm. And as I became conscious and, you know, compassionate to myself that that was all out of protection, I had no other tools and resources and really no other choice in my earliest environment. One of the things that I think, because a lot of people do resonate with disconnecting, dissociating, and then the lack of memories of experiences, we can't kind of call to mind what all of those years for me, those decades looked like. I can't put on the movie screen of my past and revisit that. So as I hold all of this and now my conscious awareness, I hold compassion for why it happened for me. And I think I hear from a lot of us, especially in our membership, the self healer circle is a lot of grief, a lot of moments of, wow, I've missed out on a lot of my life. There's a lot of things now that I can't get back or experiences that I've had that I haven't been able to fully embody the experience of having because of this self-protection mechanism. So when we're talking about overwhelm, we're talking about making space for all of this. Now that I'm grounded in my body and I 
feel that grief. It's another moment where it's so easy for me to want to check out and to say, this is too overwhelming. I'd rather just continue to live on my spaceship and check in with me some decades down the line, and I'll probably still be here. So honoring again, the, the function of overwhelm, which so many of us drives us right back into those familiar habits and patterns, because now we do feel out at sea. We do feel emotions. We do feel grief that we had been so protected from. And it is so easy to return to those old ways of coping with that. There were a few words in there that just keep echoing since you've said them that are now that I'm in my body, I can feel grief. And I agree. I think grief is such a a fundamental and really a base layer of what so many of us have resisted and what so many of us really need to allow ourselves to feel in order to be present, in order to actually be on a healing journey is to feel that grief. And feeling grief means putting yourself in the most vulnerable position because grief is something that needs to move through you. You don't get to dictate it. You don't get to tell it when it starts or when it stops. It's there. That is so threatening to a human being because we have a thing called ego. So there's this overpowering emotion state of being in grieving that overtakes your ego. You can't just say, oh, no, I'll stop that and shut that down. Though so many of us attempt to do that and don't ever allow ourselves to get to a state of grief in the first place. So all we've ever known is living in the state of ego that has sent us off on our spaceship, disconnected us from ourselves, from our body, because the thought of having an uncontrollable emotion or that pain in your heart or in your body is the last thing that your ego is going to allow when it is set on protecting you and surviving. Anything that derails that is going to get so pushed down, which is why we live in such a culture where no one grieves. People die and it's, you know, onward and upward the next day as if nothing really happened. And I think ultimately we can apply this, this conversation about the overwhelming nature to all of our emotional experiences, especially for those of us who never learned how to be attuned to our body that's having or housing these this discomfort, this, this suffering. And the reality of it is, is that very few of us know how to be with our emotions. So I see a lot of people challenged um, whether or not they read it in how to do the work or, you know, when we'll post a meme about the the lifespan, if you will, of emotions being around 90 seconds, because to speak to the point, very few of us feel emotions come and go so quickly because when we become conscious, what we're becoming conscious to is the lifetime of suppressed emotions. They're not just uh, connected to our immediate happenings. They are the volcano beneath the surface of every time we felt angry, every time we felt sad. So when you hear someone like myself say, oh, it's only 90 seconds, it's not the lived reality of it. The lived reality of it is they are completely overwhelming. Any emotion I have is completely overwhelming because I don't know how to deal with it because therefore it's been under the surface for so long. So when I begin to touch it, it isn't just a nice 90 second marker of how I'm experiencing my surrounding. It's a lifetime that's been buried beneath the surface. So then we enter into that state of overwhelm. I don't know how to deal with this. I'm afraid, going back to a conversation we had around fear a couple episodes ago, I'm afraid I won't be able to handle this. I'm afraid I won't ever come out the other side. However long it is that this emotional lasts, I'm actually afraid it will never end or it will consume me. It will overtake me. My life will implode or explode as a result. And again, if you tuned into that episode, you have no other reason to think otherwise because in your past, which is where you're now living, that is what happened. You were under-resourced. You were under-supported. There wasn't that safe container, though the beauty of being able to be present to our emotions now, being you brought up that concept of safe container, it really is an indicator that there is a beginning safety foundation that you're creating, whether or not it's even in just the connection to your physical body, that you can be present to all of these underlying sensations or shifts you're changing in your own awareness, learning how to see your emotions for what they are, not who you are, but a part of your experience. So for all of us, as we become conscious, as emotions bubble to the surface, that's actually a sign that we are becoming a little bit safer for them to be present to us in this new way. That 
aspect has been so helpful for me for years on my own journey that it's an acknowledgement that anything that comes up on the journey, because new things will, you'll be cruising along for two or three years and suddenly it's like running into a brick wall and you're thinking, where the hell did that just come from? Well, you've created a safe enough space and a regulated enough space, even if you're still dysregulated in some ways, if you're on a journey of healing for three years, you are definitely not where you were three years ago. So in this new space or container of safety, you are allowing more things to bubble up that didn't just pop out of nowhere or get created in the now. They've been there all along. And now you are at a space where you're safe enough to allow them to come forth. You're also able and equipped to deal with them, to process them, to see them. You just said the words seeing your emotion. As we are, begin to become conscious or heal, we can see our emotion. Well, what does that mean? It means that you're recognizing now that I am not the emotion. I am a being that is experiencing X emotion. You can see that separation. And when you can see that separation, this is the first step in that consciousness or any practice of awareness, you see that you are not your thoughts. You are the thinker of your thoughts. Well, the emotion is connected because where does an emotion come from? It comes from your thought. Where does a memory come from? It's just a recalled thought. And when you recall that thought and that's what's swirling or happening in this mind of yours, there is a connected emotion. So when you can experience that, that is a huge place for you to pause, to acknowledge and to honor yourself instead of that critical voice that I know for many of us comes in and like, oh my gosh, I'm so overwhelmed. I can't do this. I'm stuck X, Y, and Z. Whoa, pause for a second and say, wow, I can acknowledge that I'm feeling this. I'm feeling really overwhelmed. That's such a big step that we just so often skip over. And if you actually look at, quote, overwhelm or stress for what it is, it literally does not exist in the world. You cannot package overwhelm. You can't slice and dice it. It doesn't exist out there. Overwhelm is the energy of a thought that we have created. And whether we want to believe it or not, we have chosen those thoughts. Now, there are a lot of thoughts that just stream through our head. And if we're unaware or on an autopilot, then those thoughts are just going to keep running like a conveyor belt. And I'm just this human meat machine that's like letting them run through. When we become conscious and intentional, we did an episode a few episodes back that's the power of intention. When we become intentional, we are becoming conscious of those thoughts. We're becoming aware of the ones that are coming through, which then allows us to be aware of the emotion that's attached to it. And with that awareness, we can then choose to reframe and pick a different thought that better serves us. And again, you're not going to be able to do that right away just every time, but the only way you're going to be able to start choosing a different thought is by actually setting the intention to do it and then being willing enough to actually notice, oh my gosh, okay, that thought's coming. I'm going to switch to something better. I'm going to switch to something that feels good or even declare the words to myself, I want to feel good and start creating and affirming that belief for ourselves. Because ultimately, um, the reality of it is when we are present to the moment and we create this separation, we can then give ourselves the opportunity that these age-old thoughts or interpretations or meanings that we're making of the events around us could possibly not apply to this situation. They could possibly be inaccurate in this moment because ultimately that's why we feel on the on the heels of our thoughts is because we're interpreting you know all of the emotions that have been housed in our bodies suppressed below the surface and then we're applying that through a filter and making meaning using what we're feeling in our body to assess what's happening though for the large majority of us like we just were speaking about because all of these emotions have been so suppressed to use your beautiful analogy because we've weed whacked this forest and traveled down these same ruts of meanings for so long then we have no other choice or until we become conscious we have no other choice but to apply the exact same meaning to events so as we become conscious that all of this is happening that we do tell ourselves the same stories we interpret our life the same ways by turning our attention to what's happening here and now, now we can extend into the possibility of, wait a minute, 
this might not apply as assuredly as I thought it did to my current circumstances, which is why we're always talking about when we talk about consciousness practice, building it into moments, right? Grounding our attention, becoming aware of A, how conscious or unconscious I am when I come to the determination that, wow, my mind was somewhere else. I was worrying about something that happened this morning. I was fearing something of tomorrow. You're like me. I don't know where my mind was. It was just somewhere else entirely. That's a, a big gift because now that I'm aware that I'm not being conscious, I can refocus my attention just like as my world is being colored by all of these age old meanings and interpretations. As I practice this over time, I can give myself the opportunity to question, to wonder if maybe this moment is different, doesn't have to be that same trail that I've traveled down. And if I can entertain a new, a new interpretation, a new affirmation, a new thought about what could actually be happening. A lot of what you're hearing us talk about right now in this episode and this analogy of the forest, uh, we talk about and go in depth more a couple episodes back the title of that episode is called Meet Your Habit Self. So if you're resonating with this conversation and you haven't listened to that episode yet, I definitely suggest heading over to the Meet Your Habit Self episode after this one as they they really do all merge together. It's the, the separation of seeing that thought and those feelings that really are what create us in a state of overwhelm. And all those then are those thoughts and feelings or emotions then come outwardly in a series of habits and patterns, which is where that forest analogy comes from. That, you know, to where I am right now, there was a forest that I was already gifted with that I didn't necessarily consciously create. But the beautiful thing about being a human is that we do have the ability to create. In the same way someone might go to the gym and intentionally sculpt their body and, you know, trace their macros and want to get strong in certain parts or bulk up certain parts, you can do that. You can literally design your physique. You can also do the same to your brain. Just as trauma will form certain neural pathways in the shape of your brain, you can also unlearn and really reimagine, rebuild, and design your own brain. And ultimately, it all begins by the very overwhelming process of, of being conscious. And just to use a personal example because I very much resonate with my familiar being overwhelmed this entire conversation is as I became conscious of myself and my habits, I would notice that the moment my eyes opened in the morning, I was telling myself the litany of everything I had to do that day and not in a excited way. I get to do all of these things, but in, a, oh my gosh, I can't believe I have so much to do. I might even say internally in my mind and sometimes externally out of my mouth, I'm so stressed out. And I would almost like a mantra repeat how, how much I have to do and how little time I have to do it, and therefore how stressed I am. And as I became aware of that, then I had the possibility of, well, Nicole, this is exactly how you are creating. By lunchtime, you're exhausted. You are completely overwhelmed. You don't feel like you can even address the rest of the day ahead of you. And it wasn't surprising then that as I entered in my 30s, I was literally burnt out and my entire body began to shut down because it all was happening. That whole process was happening unbeknownst to me, unconscious to me. As I became conscious, it was very overwhelming. It was very humbling to see, oh, geez, Nicole, if you didn't just from the moment you woke up to the moment you went to bed, affirm how stressed you were and under-supported or under-resourced you were, if you didn't affirm that, noticing that I was affirming, that gave me the possibility not to look ahead. My, my timeline or my to-do list, I should say, didn't change. But if I just refocused my attention on the choice I had at that moment, which maybe wasn't to do the work, it was to get myself out of bed, to have a cup of coffee, my day began to feel more manageable in moments. And then practicing that over time, I began to whack a new <laughs> path through the forest and it began to shift. My overwhelm began to diminish, decrease just a little bit because I was able to see how I was keeping it alive in those old stories, in those old narratives, and in my marching orders. <laughs> <laughs> your thoughts literally mm -hmm. create your reality. So if you're walking around saying, you know, I'm stressed, I'm tired all day long, well, <laughs> you literally can't be anything but stressed or tired because that's the declaration and the state of being that you are choosing. You might be autopilot choosing it. You might mm -hmm. not be consciously choosing it, but that's what's happening, which is why becoming conscious is so important and really so 
imperative and necessary in actually designing and creating your life and healing those old wounds and traumas because those thoughts are going to create your reality whether you're paying attention to it or not. And it's super important, again, with this compassion, keep it at the ready to hold that for yourself, hold a state of loving compassion for yourself in the moments that you are going to continue saying, I'm stressed, I'm tired, I can't do this, I'm overwhelmed, I'm stuck, because you're human, that's going to happen. And if your resources are low, you better believe that that old way of being that is so ingrained in you is going to come back. I still notice that in myself, in us, in, in any human. If I'm low on my resources, if I haven't slept, if I haven't taken care of myself, if I haven't moved my body, all of the things, then my self-talk comes in super critical. I get really like snippy or put off by my partners. Nicole might come and, you know, express love to me. And I'm like, mm, nope, force field. I don't want it. Stay away. Leave me in my misery. If Nicole doesn't get sleep or doesn't have her resources, then those that the morning of, you know, this is what I have to do today. I'm so tired. I didn't sleep well. That's going to continue on repeat because that was the default for so long. And if I'm what, 36 now, my birthday was just a couple of days ago. So if I spent 30 years of my life being one way, why am I to think that suddenly when I've devoted a couple of years of my life to healing and becoming conscious that I'm just you know magically fixed or cured? No, my default is going to go to the bulk majority. It's going to go back to where it was for 30 years, which is why we say really to do the smallest new action that you can to make your healing and your new choices, your new habits as small and digestible as possible. And the intention with this episode and really diving into overwhelm is sort of a pre-context as to why you hear us saying all the time, make a small daily promise, make a small, small choice to do something new or to honor your future or best self. It's so that you can help the already present resistance and overwhelm to that newness and to that change. If we do something really small, like stretching first thing in the morning when we get out of bed, drinking a glass of water, setting a check-in on our phone for, you know, when it goes off to check in with my senses, my sight, my sound, what am I hearing, any sense that's available to me, that's practicing consciousness. As small as it is, if I follow through on that, I have now for the first time walked down a new path, as Nicole's mm -hmm. saying, with the weed whacker. <laughs> I'm walking through this forest on a brand new path, beginning to carve it. Now, if I walk down it once on that small promise and never do it again, it's going to disappear. If I follow through on this small promise, I walk down that path. I now have my own proof too and my own reference. I'm creating a memory for myself where I have now witnessed myself follow through. I do that again and again and again, and that path becomes more and more defined where eventually my auto response is going to be to walk down that path and not the old ingrained path from the past because now that one is starting to get brushed over and grown over because I haven't been walking down it. I haven't been accessing it. I've been refocusing my thoughts on the new path. While we're having this conversation and getting ready to end it in terms of the compassion piece, holding space for the reality that we aren't going to keep those promises all of the time. We are going to return to those old habitual patterns. And one of the things that I have been seeing um, in the self-healer circle, we just had an enrollment last month. So all of the new members are invited to engage with the course Awaken Consciousness. So having this conversation essentially that we're having with all of you here today is becoming conscious and hearing about this report of feeling overwhelmed. And then a lot of self-criticism as people begin to now witness very consciously the return to their old habits, the, the tendency to disconnect, to dissociate, to want to do those old things. So this is another space again to hold grace and compassion or to extend that to ourselves. Because to speak to your point, when we are under-resourced, when we don't yet feel fully safe continuing to walk into this unknown, we likely will rely on those old habits. And we're only going to, we're, we're only going to add to our overwhelm by 
adding self-critical judgment by taking this now to mean that we're unworthy, just like we believed ourselves to be. So another beautiful moment when we notice whenever it is in the moment, several moments later, several days later of disconnection or of old habitual behaviors, reminding yourself, just like we've been talking about that each moment we have the opportunity to make a new choice. We can let all of the moments go, all of how we feel about all of the critical judgment of how we shouldn't have returned back. Maybe hearing this conversation in your mind that of course you returned back. That's the habit. That's that pathway that's been so well worn. And then breaking all of this down, this even concept of small daily promise to just that moment. What can I decide to do now? Can I disengage my my conscious awareness on the present moment? Can I return maybe to that small daily promise and just practice keeping it right here, right now? Because one of the most overwhelming things I think is when we look at, you know, the whole story, all that we came from, everywhere we want to go in the future, and we overwhelm ourselves by having too big of a scope. It's not to say that we won't get there at some point, but we have to find that small path forward. And that begins in each and every moment. So as always, we appreciate all of you tuning in, watching this on the YouTube channel, sharing this with loved ones that you think will resonate, engaging with our Instagram account and our new, actually our new Twitter, or you, those of you out there who use Twitter at SH Soundboard. And we love always hearing your feedback, your ideas for future episodes. And staying tuned to next episode, we're actually going to dive back into the How to Meet Yourself workbook and talk about some practical exercises or ways to decrease the overwhelm by focusing in the moment, in consciousness, in practice. So those of you who are interested in that discussion, tune in to next time, and we look forward to connecting with you all then.